Blacksburg is a great little town. You can walk or bike almost anywhere. Um, folks are super friendly. They'll do anything for you. Rich in Appalachian heritage, abounding with the youthful exuberance and cultural diversity of university life, this is the ideal small town. Surrounded by a pristine and natural beauty, it draws many a visitor back to claim it as home. Across the globe, our planet's natural resources are being unsustainably harvested, and the related wars and conflicts challenge the survival of all species. No town is an island. We are all connected. Corporation's not a person. Corporation's not a person. Like, there's such a like distinct culture about Appalachia in and of itself. You know what? first heard about the uh, Mountain Valley Pipeline coming through the area, there, there was concern. As mayor of Blacksburg, it's important for me to learn as much as I can. I did go to one of the informational meetings and uh, heard from a lot of the residents that uh, um, there were potential problems with it. We've discussed it as a council and uh, passed a resolution back in December of 2014 stating a lot of the reasons for Council's concern and Blacksburg's concern in asking that the, uh, the permit be denied. We talked about cars, we talked about our first responders, we talked about tourism, and that one of the, the big tourist draws for this area is the, the natural beauty. So those are the things that we talked about in our resolution. So Council has taken a position on this. From everything I've seen and everything that I've heard is that there really are no local economic benefits uh, going to continue traveling, um, there are not going to be a lot of options, if any, for, for local hookups. Most often it seems like the crews that you, you know, they used to make these things aren't really that big. We're not talking about employing a, a whole lot of people and they're not necessarily going to be from this area. You know, dirty, dirty money and dirty gas going down the way. And I just yeah, I think about everybody's water and wells and families that have children that are getting toxic metals in, into their bath water. The fact that they're bringing it through here and none of it will be for us. If they were going to share along the way to help the needs of people everywhere, it would be understood better. But just to make it get out to the coast to send it to China, I don't appreciate that. But most of it, I'm absolutely sure, will go to ports where they're building a port facility to liquefy the gas and send it to foreign countries. Because it's costing them on the median about $4.85 per thousand cubic feet. So they can't afford to sell it at 2.5 or 2.7. Many of these companies have sold their shale leases because of, the big companies particularly, because they know that they, they can't make any money on it. I think one of the, the, uh, the concerns when we talk about building the pipeline and, and its impact, uh, the wide swath that it will take, I mean, I've heard anywhere from 100 to 200 feet, the amount of uh, degradation that goes into uh, you know, the land to, to make that happen, the, the construction vehicles, uh, so all of those are, are, I think, a concern, a legitimate concern that anybody close to it should have. First heard about the pipeline, we got a notice and it's going to come right through the middle of our garden. And if it did that, it was effectively going to put me out of business. You know, because it's going through our main crop Dead set plant, against it. People forget that uh, the pounds per square inch going through these pipelines is tremendous. And uh, the size of the pipeline itself is, is tremendous. So the potential 
for a catastrophe are there just because of that. I think that when people are looking at compressor stations, the noise, uh, the potential for explosion, um, they, they need to take a close look at where it is and again its impact on the general surrounding area. We are karst topography uh, here in this area. Uh, water travels underground and travels far, so the potential for contamination of wells and contamination of a lot of people's water supplies is something people should think about. Our biggest concern with the pipelines are these linear features, they cut through everything. They cut through the national forest, they cut across streams. Uh, the, the cold water streams that hold trout in Virginia and uh, West Virginia. When you're coming straight up and down a, a mountainside, the potential for erosion and sediment running off is just tremendous. So, you know, literally uh, one big event could just wipe out the trout population from that crossing down. And when, when you talk about pipelines, the idea of having two or three or four running through various areas of the Commonwealth um, really to me seems a bit redundant. A FERC has actually asked uh, the two pipelines, the, the, uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipelines to consider co-location because both pipelines are starting within about 20 miles of each other over in Wetzel County and are actually crossing each other. Uh, both have said that uh, they have no interest in it, it's not possible, uh, they would interrupt their construction schedules and, and many other things. You know, when, when you see at the 4th of July parade, there are a lot of people voicing their opinion. I, I think that that is one of the truly great hallmarks of our country, is that people can voice their opinion and feel always comfortable doing it. You know, every day of the week, we should all be aware of things like this. So 4th of July is just another big event day that we should take a moment and think about where we all came from and how we're all connected and we're all in this together. There's no, there's no time for the pettiness that's going on in our country and our, right now and the horrible, horrible things that are happening. I feel very strongly about that. If people don't think racism and climate control and things like that aren't an issue. They need to open their eyes. It's a sad time. I agree that the environment is so important, but being able to voice that, being able to be out there, uh, we can't remain silent on anything we all feel very strongly about, and w whatever that is. So I think it has been a concern over the last 15 years to, to watch some of the um, landmark legislation, the Clean Water Act, um, you know, one of the ones that come to mind, being set aside. Uh, it is, I think, short-sighted, and we've all got to work hard to look towards the future. If there is an accident, if there's an explosion, uh, anything happens, it's our first responders that are going to have to be there. I take that very seriously. And when you look at, at explosions that have happened both in Pennsylvania and California, much smaller lines caused a great deal of devastation and deaths and wiped out a, you know, a neighborhood. So there's that potential. Uh, I'm very proud of Blacksburg's focus on sustainability. That fast charger for charging electric cars. It's about five times faster than other charging stations in Blacksburg. Please return the connector to its cradle and close the door until it clicks. Thank you for using our service. So Drive this safely. So this uh, DC fast charger was donated by uh, Virginia Clean Cities to the town of Blacksburg, and this is going to be a really big addition, a great addition to our transition to a lower fossil fuel transportation infrastructure here in the town. We launched the Solarize Blacksburg initiative in early 2014 and we set as a program goal that we really wanted to double the amount of residential solar in our community. What happened was really exciting. Um, there was so much pent up demand for clean energy in our community. We couldn't believe the outcome. We actually more than quadrupled the amount of solar that is in Blacksburg now. We were even more gratified about what happened across the state. Communities all across the entire state of Virginia took notice of what we were doing and they reached out to us and we said, yeah, we would love for you to launch one of your own. To date, more than 20 other Virginia communities have launched Solarize initiatives of their own. Last I heard, the amount of residential solar has actually doubled across the state. Uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors took notice and awarded us the 2015 Climate Protection Award for a small city. Which is significant, I think really speaks highly to this, what the citizens of Blacksburg, what they cherish and uh, what they want to focus on. The younger people especially recognize the importance of a clean environment and they want to have a cleaner environment for the future. And they want to have uh, sustainable energy. They don't want fossil energy, which is eventually going to go away. Virginia Tech's motto is to invent the future. And um, 
with that we should be inventing the right kind of future, a more sustainable future. Virginia Tech has a climate action commitment plan which states they would like to reduce emissions by from 1990 levels by 80 percent by the year 2050. We need to change that number from 2050 to maybe 2025 or 2030. So Virginia Tech has one of the cleanest coal plants in the nation. There's still some issues with the proximity of it to some dorms on campus. So we met with President Sands a few times um, in the past year since he started and that's been a pretty positive experience. He's on board and supports what we're doing. The Students for Clean Energy have an emphasis on research. The first stage of our plan is a solar farm which based on our solar analysis and feasibility studies could provide about 6% of Virginia Tech's current energy demands. And we call it the 30 by 30 plan. Our organization is devoted to the more intangible process of divesting our money from fossil fuels and Students for Clean Energy is devoted to the more tangible process of removing fossil fuel infrastructure from our campus. Ultimately we're getting at the same goal where we as students believe that these are this is wrong for our future, this is wrong for our environment, and we wish to stop our dependency on fossil fuels entirely. Because we have a coal plant on campus, because we have a mining engineering program, we receive lots of funds from fossil fuel companies, not necessarily in a position to divest um, even in the near future, unfortunately, but we're starting to um, begin that dialogue. So over the past year, year and a half, we've had about a little over 2,000 students sign our petition. We're out on the drill field all the time with our petitions trying to stop people and talk about this. I do not want corporations like EQT and Next Air to speak to my values. Let's mobilize! Oh, stand! <laughs> we will not let you drill this pipeline! What? It's very important that we continue to look for ways to protect our water, to uh, you know, protect um, just a lot of the natural landscape. You think about the habitat and what's, what's happening to food supply, um, the impact it have to the honeybees. And just that one little thing, just that, that one little area. I started beekeeping about 20 years ago. It was something my father did and I was around bees as a youngster and as I grew older I decided I wanted to get some too. They're a hobby. I probably don't make any money on them, but I enjoy playing with them. I sell some honey around town and give some to my friends and I eat a lot of it. Uh, it's nothing like the store bought, much better. <laughs> well, we're trying to amend the town ordinance to uh, allow up to six backyard laying hens uh, to improve the quality of life in our community. Uh, it's a sustainable practice and we just believe that uh, there really wouldn't be a negative uh, impact at all in the community. It would just provide eggs and happiness to people. <laughs> we're, we're headed for a large temperature change, average earth temperature change. And already, no matter what we do, we're headed for a lot, probably at least two, maybe three degrees. And so you can already see that in the droughts in the West, the droughts in some of the African countries, and Australia, other countries, and the, and the huge rainfalls that occur in some places, uh, floods, all of this is going to continue, it's going to get worse. The tornadoes, all this is going to get worse if we keep doing this. There's a New York Times op-ed piece about the dangers of climate engineering. A lot of the people who've been uh, naysayers about climate change are now are saying, well, we can adapt to this with climate engineering. And that's a very slippery slope and what so many people, people have referred to as the Hail Mary pass. Uh, we don't know what the consequences of it would be. And we've got to remember that all the different parts of our natural landscape are related and intertwined, and one does affect the other. We have children, I have grandchildren, um, I think a lot about them as to what, um, what they'll inherit. And so it's very important that we continue to think about sustainability, we think about the environment, we think about the impact we have. So what's clear to me is that the citizens of Blacksburg are really ready for a clean energy future. And it seems to me that the last thing they want is more investment in fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to protect our environment. This area of Virginia is beautiful. It's known as one of the most scenic, most beautiful areas in anywhere in the country. In, in recent years, 
the uh, corporate America has gained much, much too much power. We are an oligopoly now, as a practical matter. Uh, the corporate America is, is, is dictating the policies of our country. One of the industries we regulate is the interstate transportation of natural gas. What that means is that a commission decision cannot be changed by the executive or legislative branches, but a FERC decision can be challenged in court. The FERC is an independent agency and self-funding. It pays for its operations through fees on the industries it regulates. The FERC doesn't answer to the executive or legislative branches of government, but you can have your day in federal court, the only place that their decisions may be reviewed. This is the most dysfunctional Congress that I can remember. They can't get their act together to do anything. We are a democracy. The people ultimately will have their say, but they have to participate. They have to be educated, and they have to be informed, and they have to make their views known. In recent news, utility company Roanoke Gas has just acquired a 1% stake in the Mountain Valley Pipeline, facilitating the pipeline company's claim of public use, just in time to file their formal application to the FERC for a certificate of convenience and necessity. Whose side are you on? That's what people need to hear. Are you on the side of the people, on the side of the environment, on the side of the future? Or are you on the side of short-term profits? That's really the big issue. We just need to be very responsible in how we use our resources. Love, love, love. We are on the ship. Great big ship. Takes all of us to take care of them. Without an immediate ban on these destructive, extractive industries, we are indeed heading for disaster. We are all connected, and in time, we will all be affected. We must and can rely solely on renewable energy resources. Come save Virginia from this wretched corporate Community veto the right to say no. Community veto the right to say no. The right to change begins with you and with me, and sharing that change with everyone.